Buenas tardes, uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Nakomi Bentley, um, and I'm from a small company called Stencilla, based in New Zealand, um, and we make software for dynamic uh, data driven documents. Um, so, this is the original title of my talk. Sorry. This is the original title of my talk. Uh, it sort of rhymes and it's got some nice acronyms in there, but it's quite a mouthful and um, maybe a bit clickbaity. So I came up with another title, which is um, Making Stochastic Parrots Announce Their Parent Their Presence. So hopefully as the talk goes on, the reason for this will come apparent. So as I said, I come from New Zealand um, here. Christchurch, New Zealand. And a lot of people have said, I oh, come all the way from New Zealand to, to come to Buenos Aires all the way over here. It's a long way to travel. And um, yeah, if you look at this map of the world like we're used to seeing, it looks like somewhere like San Francisco or London is much closer to Buenos Aires than all the way over here. But if you look at the world from a different perspective, based on the South Pole, you'll actually see that Christchurch, New Zealand, where I come from, is actually quite close to Buenos Aires. And to get here, I just flew across the Pacific, um, didn't have to go all the way around. And I think this, these two maps quite e illustrate one of the concerns around the use of generative AI in research. Um, one of the concerns there is that if all you know, the training data that AI models are based on is in English and has an Anglo-American-centric um, uh, um, bias, then maybe the answers that we're getting from generative AI are going to be biased similarly. So I'm going to be talking about some of the benefits, risks, and roles of generative pre-trained transformers and other generative AI in research. Um, the first of the things I'm going to talk about really are but some of the risks involved in that, that. And the alternative title of my talk, Stochastic Car Parrots, um, owes to this paper um, from Bender et al. in 2001, 21. Um, where they first coined this phrase. Um, and this paper goes into a lot of detail about potential risks. Um, we just saw in the previous talk in this room um, from Adrian um, some of the risks in terms of uh, exploitation of workers, the labelling, um, the data sets are being used, these models are being used to train on. Um, but in this talk, I'm going to really focus on some of the aspects of the risk to research. And as many of you will be aware, um, one of the risks in using GPTs, generative AI and research, is that they can be confident bullshit artists. So I, I asked um, ChatBT, GPT, the same question as which I posed originally about which city is closest to Buenos Aires, London, San Francisco, Istanbul or Christchurch, where I come from. And it confidently replies that the closest city to Buenos Aires is Istanbul. Um, actually, it's the furthest of them all. <laughs> um, and if you look, I've done some fact checking here. Um, the numbers uh, in terms of kilometers are wrong. And in fact, according to the numbers that JetGPT gives us, San Francisco should be the one which it says is closest. So, there's a whole lot of things which are wrong here, and obviously for this particular question, we shouldn't rely on ChatBT BT, Jet, GPT to do our research. But there are a lot of benefits um, that people are discovering, and the last five years, seen five months, I should say, have seen a big explosion in the use of GPTs, um, and particular through Jet GPT that's been released recently. A lot of you will have tried it and found the benefits that potentially it brings to increasing your productivity. These are some of the things that personally I found GPT to be useful things. Uh, you know, it's a, a better ad-free for now search engine uh, for certain topics. Um, things like unblocking writer's block, just getting started with writing, improving first drafts, things like for researchers whose uh, first language isn't English, being able to do translation, for instance, to translate some text into scientific English. So despite the risks and the problems with GBT, I think the genie is out of the bottle, so to speak, and 
the, we're going to see um, these sorts of technologies be used in research more often. And so we are seeing that uptake already and concerns around um, ChatGPT being listed in research papers as authors, um, paper fabrication, so people using AI to generate false research papers um, and so forth. And so some of the responses to this have been things like um, what we might call a detect and ban approach. So there are certain techniques such as um, AI detection algorithms and watermarking which can be used to detect text that's been generated by generative AI. And you can see this study that was published last year. Um, the original abstracts, which are written by humans, this AI detection software does quite well in um, classifying most of them as being having 0% AI detection score, whereas the ones that were actually generated by ChatGTP have, um, most of them have scores, but it's not perfect. And we're still, these algorithms are still missing up on some of the um, AI generated content. Even despite this, these detection algorithms, we're finding that um, slight modifications to the wording, so you get your chat GPT text to make slight modifications to the wording, and these AI detection um, algorithms start to fail and form much worse. So a more nuanced approach, rather than saying just detect and ban, a more nuanced approach is to say, well, we'll allow you to use um, AI for polishing your work. Um, and so rather than just copying and pasting from JetPT, JetPT, I have a problem saying that, GPT, um, into, your, into your scientific article, um, we'll allow you to use it for editing. And that, raises the questions of how do you draw the line between editing and writing. This is a sort of more nuanced approach that we already have in place for um, the roles of human authors in research. So you might be familiar with something called the Contributor Roles Taxonomy, which is 14 roles that can be used to represent the roles typically played by contributors in research outputs. And so we have things like conceptualization, funding acquisition, methodology, visualization, writing of the original draft and so forth. And maybe we need to start to think about how we can formulate some roles for generative AI in research. Things like um, editing work, text you've already written, translating, summarizing, um, generating code, for instance, in dynamic documents such as Jupyter Notebooks, you might want to, want to use AI there, but making that explicit and crediting the roles of different, not only humans, but also AIs in that process. So I've talked then about GBTs and, and generative AI in general. But the other technology that I want to talk about today is conflict-free replicated data types. And these are um, a technology that's emerged just in the last um, decade or so. And they're really seen as an alternative for decentralized collaboration um, that's similar to using Google Docs, but allowing um, us not to all rely on Google servers and centralized collaboration where Google control our data. Um, and there's a group of researchers, including Mark Kletman from the University of um, Cambridge and others who have come together under the um, Ink and Switch organization that have really led a lot of the work in developing these algorithms that allow um, this offline collaboration. One of the important things about CRDTs is they allow synchronization of really highly structured documents. So here's a, a to-do list, and you might have one user editing the to-do list on one machine, and then on another device, um, completely offline, not requiring a separate, uh, a separate server. Um, you've got another person using this, editing this to-do list. And it involves not just text, but also 
Boolean values and arrays and so forth. And when there's a network communication available, when someone goes online, these two versions can sync and you get the same result in the end. And then another important aspect of CRTTs for today's talk is the fact that they allow for really fine-grained version control and branching. So some really recent work done by um, Carissa McKelvey and other people at Ink and Switch looked at how you could use CRDTs to do Git style version control and merging and branching. And so this sort of illustrates the way that I see that we might be able to combine these two technologies, CRDTs and um, GPTs. So can we use CRDTs to track the provenance of research content, including that content that is created by AIs. So this approach um, could be labelled trust but verify approach, in that we're going to say that well, let's trust authors to use generative AI responsibly. They're not going to just um, ask it to write a scientific paper from, for them. They're going to use, them, use it to help them edit their text and just make themselves more productive. We want to move away from a copy and paste uh, of generated text into a Word document and instead move towards treating generative AI as a contributor in the paper that we explicitly acknowledge the role that it's had. And we do this by automatically recording the prompts that we use to ask the generative AI assistants to help us, um, and then record any fine-grained changes that the generative AI has made. So we can see where in the document AI has been involved and exactly what changes and what words can be attributed to the humans and that what words can be attributed to the AI. So what would this look like? So you might be an author on a paper and you've written a paragraph that is about the methods that you used um, and then you ask the, the AI to improve the wording of this paragraph, make it more concise. And so the AI responds, sure, here are some suggested changes and it's removed some words and it's added in some words. And instead of this just being a blob of text that we're going to copy and paste into uh, document, um, what we're going to do is actually review and accept some of those changes. So it be the AI becomes an assistant in um, the process and we can say well, we're going to accept or reject some or all of those changes. And using what the, the version control um, aspects of CRDTs, we can then have a history of the document including where AI was um, it gone through and edited a particular paragraph where we can record the prompt that we used and who we reviewed and merged it in. And so just like you would use a, a Git log to get a history of changes to a document, we can use um, the CRDTs to generate the similar summary. So this is what this is an approach that we're exploring at the moment with Stencilla. Um, we have a, all our documents are represented by JSON data. So this is similar to what I showed you before with the um, to-do list. CRDTs allow us to represent these documents as these version controlled um, repositories. And we can then um, incorporate artificial intelligence just like we do with normal um, users where we can record their organisation and their first and given name, where we can record um, potentially the version, the name of the AI that was used and so forth. If anyone's interested, this is a link to the repo, you can see what we're doing there on that now. And then the advantage of that is that when we publish this document as HTML, all that metadata about the affiliations, um, including potentially the AI, can be published to the web and I'll just finish off with a Maori proverb um, that links back to my alternative um, title for the talk. Um, as the sheer water announces its presence, as the parent announces presence, so too do I. Thank you.
Thank you so much for that, Nakome. We have four minutes for questions. Does anyone have a question they would like to ask? Yes, I will come to you. Hi, thanks, that was super interesting. Um, I was wondering if you're trying to encourage uh, scientific authors to sort of record and report the use of AI. Um, do you think there are certain policies or rules that will have to be written and enforced by journals or other organizations to make that happen? Um, sort of like the trust, like how, how much are we trusting versus requiring? Yeah, I think so. I think it's probably a combination of both. Like, I mean, if you require it, then you've got to put in some sort of way of detecting it. And as I've shown, that's not foolproof. And there's, it's like um, with spam, you know, there's going to be this war against it, and they're going to find people are going to find ways around it. Um, and so, I suppose this approach that I'm advocating here is let people use it. Um, but make it easy for them to record how they've used it. And so reviewers can go through and look at the document history and say, oh, well, they used it to just make their work more efficient, and they can see exactly that it was original research with just the help of AI assistance. So, yeah. I have a question. So this reminds me of you know, other types of software that researchers and authors are already using. Can you tell us more about how that is currently being, like, recorded or recognized? Are there, you know, you know, like other tools like a Trello or a GitHub or something that people already use to help them in these processes? Are those acknowledged currently? Yeah, so I think with what we're seeing in the emergence of AI in the recent years, there's, there's an opportunity to sort of build something from the ground up in a sense that takes these factors and these issues into account. Um, when you use a tool like lots of people, researchers are using GitHub these days um, and are used to this sort of history. So this isn't a far jump from, from that, but it's just a way of avoiding that copy and paste mechanism where people are using Google Docs or Word and so forth and just copy and pasting gen generated text into their documents. Um, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, one last one. Okay, how do I start, right? Uh, I know that everybody's been talking about ChatGPT, you shouldn't use it for generating text, X and Y. But I mean, did we suddenly just forget about tools like Grammarly, Spell Checker, where you just click one button and it, it changed things? You know, like, what's your take on that? Because it's like, I feel like last year everybody was talking about Grammarly, how it stops your style, it changed your whole document, and now we just, nobody's talking about it, and everybody now is just talking about chat. So, yeah, no, what's, I think, what's the difference there? Yeah, no, I think it's a really good point. Um, yeah, all of the things have the potential to influence how we write and and what we produce. And so, yeah, I suppose the rationale behind this approach is let's at least record that and make that explicit of what tools we've used and how we've used them so that we don't need to be second guessing, you know, so that reviewers don't need to be going, oh, this person's just generated this or not. We can actually see it, yeah. Thank you, Nakome. Can we have another round of applause, please? <laughs>